Dr. Irma Jean Bainock is uh, also on um, uh, with us tonight. And Irma Jean Bainock has um, grace, graciously come out of retirement to uh, support our work on COVID in the policy department. Um, so it's the, the three of us uh, sort of officially online today with Doris and um, Olivia uh, Wilson, who many of you know as well, is an, um, controlling things in the back end. So uh, we encourage you to um, actively participate with comments and questions throughout the webinar today. And um, you should be able to find your ch the chat box on your screen. If you hover around um, on the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen, find the chat box. You might want to test that right now. And you can choose to, to write just to the RNAO staff, to all panelists. Or if it's a question or comment, please uh, I encourage you to write to all attendees so that everyone can um, see and hear what you're saying. So this is um, the plan for today. Uh, these webinars, we have a similar format each week. They're every Monday. Um, the topics are we have COVID-19 updates with some latest news and some pressing issues. Guest speakers from the front lines whenever we can, when they're available. Um, questions and answers. So today we have, I think, six um, questions that have been brought forward to us. And then we'll, um, I'm sure, have questions throughout the presentation as well. Some uh, calls to action or ways that you can get involved. And I also wanted to um, bring your attention to our COVID-19 portal. And that is free for all of you to access whenever you like. And that is an, um, a new addition on our website that helps you find what you need in terms of COVID resources. So if you haven't checked it out yet, I encourage you to do so. All of the recordings and the slides from these presentations are found online in the portal. And um, so I wanted to say one more thing about next week. Um, if uh, for those of you who are on the line who are nurses, you already know this, that next week is a very important week for us. It's nursing week. And so we are going to kick off nursing week in the Monday evening with um, a focus on nursing week and um, COVID-19 still, but a uh, nursing focus. So uh, stay tuned for that. And I'll just do um, check the chat box and see if there's anything that I need to know there. And we've got a few questions coming in um, and others that are asking how to get into the chat box. So I just remind you that there's a bubble at the bottom of your screen. It might be at the top or the side, depending on which device you have, but just says chat and we'll put all the chat uh, questions in there so that we can respond to you. And we've got well over a hundred people um, on the line right now. That's great. And uh, let's just see. So what we'll do is um, sometimes we have a very um, inquisitive group with lots and lots of questions and we'll do our best to answer as much as we can to tonight. Um, questions that aren't answered, we can, um, we can post them and follow up um, next week with our um, webinar, um, a slide with some answers, and some questions that might need to be sort of escalated to Doris for uh, maybe something that has to do with a policy issue, we can um, bring those forth as well. So welcome, uh, Deborah. Welcome to everyone else that we're seeing on the line. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to put in questions as they arise for you. Um, let me see, and we're just going to scoot ahead to some of the slides since we're just still um, waiting for uh, Doris to join us. Oh, I want to show you this hashtag. So if you're not familiar with this yet, this is our Together We Can Do It campaign. What you're probably most familiar with so far is the cheer for health workers, which is sort of, sort of Together We Can Do It is sort of our umbrella campaign. There will be more to that next week during nursing week. And what we've been doing uh, a lot so far is really focusing on that 7.30 p.m. cheer for health workers. So we hope that um, you will participate in that if you aren't already. And we might just do a cheer towards the end of this webinar today, a virtual cheer. 
And um, I'm going to scoop past some of uh, the content for Doris and show you. Oh, Susan, just to say that Paula is saying that she's working on a new video for Arneo for COVID-19. Together we can do it. Ready for nursing week. Paula <laughs> oh, very, wow. very good. Is that Paula Manuel? Yeah, oh, it is. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I'll look forward to seeing it because um, the previous video was just fantastic. And so great to have that skill set. Um, so I'll just show you, this is the COVID-19 portal, and this shows you all the main components of it. And actually, I think I'm missing the First Nations, which is the newest part of the portal. So actually I'm missing that. Uh, what we have on it is our basic resources and guidance and links to what we consider to be reputable websites. There's the COVID press room, and there are links to, I think over 150, um, uh, events and um, news articles that RNAO has been involved um, in and also um, uh, various events that Doris has participated in. We've got our webinars that are archived, the blog, uh, all of the blogs and previous daily updates from Doris are accessible there. So it's an excellent resource. Uh, moving up to the top right hand corner is our COVID-19 Vienna. So this is your, your one-stop location for signing up to participate in the COVID response as well as access, accessing um, nurses and PSWs, um, students and NPs to support your efforts. Um, we have support for long-term care and retirement home resources there, situational reports, uh, uh, the cheer for health workers, more information there and links to um, our Twitter account and support uh, for psychosocial support during the COVID pandemic. And we also have a new um, part of this website as well for First Nations, um, so the support that we're doing in First Nations community. And I see the chat box has been lighting up a little bit. So people are, um, wanting to be involved. So go to the COVID website and click on Via Nurse and see how you can get involved. And people are commenting on loving Paula's videos. Um, so, and Irma Jean or Heather, if I can just get one of you to check in with Doris while I go to the next yeah, slide. I will do so. Okay. And um, Susan, I just wondered why you talked about Via Nurse. Did you want to maybe talk about Somebody's asked a question about filling out the survey for virtual and clinical availability in March. Should they also fill out the long-term care one that is now out separately? And I would say yes, please. It's Heather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, because if they have skills in any of those areas, it depends where the need comes up first. And we would love to get the expertise. Yeah. And yeah. we need to have you fill out each one as they come separately. Yeah. Great, thanks for bringing that question forward. Um, I also wanted to give you a reminder, if you weren't already aware, that we do have three Facebook groups who are very active. The very first one that started was in response to the need uh, for that families had who had loved, one in, loved ones in long-term care. And we're calling this Via Families. It's an opportunity to share stories and get support from other, other people who are experiencing a similar situation as, as you with um, dealing with the impact of social distancing and other um, issues that may arise. So that one is exclusively for families of those living in long-term care. And then this, the second and third one are available to all of you and any of your colleagues. It's for nurses and other health providers. And the sharing and tackling uh, face group, group is um, about emerging issues and tackling, sharing those issues and tackling them together, problem solving and offering mutual support and um, knowledge exchange. And then the last one there is the peer-to-peer -peer support during COVID-19. And um, this is looking at sharing experiences or concerns and some sort of the psychosocial aspects of this pandemic and um, what you're doing to build your resilience and cope. So those resources are all available for you. And uh, let me just see. 
uh, we're going to revisit that afterwards. I wanted to show you the cheer for health workers. So um, those are the two hashtags. So I'm hoping maybe we can just get a sense in the chat box from people if you're seeing that in your neighborhood, hearing it, if you're participating, uh, we're hoping that it's getting louder and more enthusiastic each night. Um, you might hear in the background that when it comes to 7.30, if, I, if I'm not muted, there's a lot of ruckus in our neighborhood and I hope the same for you. And um, bands, um, music, musical groups that are playing at a, social, a safe distance and all kinds of exciting things that are happening there. And here is a snapshot of just some of what's been happening. Um, we have Slovakia is in the bottom left hand um, corner there and they've become involved in this as well. And on the top right hand corner, that's um, some people in India who let us know what was going on there for their cheer for health workers and using the same hashtag. Um, you can see people banging pots and pans and the um, bottom right hand corner heroes work here. You may have seen signs like that popping up to uh, show support for the long term care sector. Um, and the top left hand corner is the, um, the what are they called? Uh, cob, horn on the cob, I think. And they, oh, right. every yeah. single night, they've been going out and playing great music for the neighborhood. So it's uh, to cheer for health workers as well as raise spirits for people on the front lines. So, and physical distancing. Um, Jean-Paul Gauthier just put in, oh, maybe I um, missed some of the chat here and I'm taking this out of context. Uh, just to say that Doris is just having a bit of difficulty connecting, but we're just sending her the link, so she should be okay. in a short. That sounds good. Yeah, I don't know, Susan, if someone used the word social distancing and uh, Paul uh -oh. Gauthier is just uh, reminding us all that the term is physical distancing. Yes, you know, thank, the yes, thank you for, for clarifying what he meant there. And yes, I've got to um, be, I, I've got to get on that and be more specific that we are talking about is the physical distancing and we want to keep ourselves social in, in new ways. So um, yeah, thanks for correcting me on that. We've got lots of comments. Some people are saying that the peer-to-peer -peer group is really helpful. It's helping her a lot. And Bolton is loud and cheering apparently, which is good to hear. <laughs> yeah. And it's getting louder at Broadview and Danforth. Oh, um, yes. Yes, right. yes, yes. And then physical distancing versus social, which is important uh, for just yeah. in terms of our own mental health and everybody else's yeah. too. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's good. So I'm just going to go and uh, slip away for a moment just to see if I can help Doris get herself lost. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's this sort of sense, I don't know in your community, but in my community, there's a sense that we're starting to kind of get back to normal, which makes me a little bit nervous. Mm. Um, I think with hearing of different, you know, some um, businesses reopening in different parts of the world and across Canada and slowly kind of opening up here that that plus the good weather, I just feel like there's a lot of relaxation happening and people are letting their guards down. So that message of physical distancing really needs to be something that we're all um, very consistent with and um, keeping that message right front and center. I don't know if that's the case. Yeah, COVID-19 COVID fatigue and cabin fever, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think I'm probably not the only one who's, who's kind of getting that sense that that's that's happening. Let's see. Actually, there was a very good um, tweet uh, on the weekend about someone who talked about how difficult it is to stay the course when you actually don't have markers about the end. And they likened it to jogging. And if you're jogging along and don't have any idea where it's going to end, um, it's really hard to keep up the pace. And, you know, it, I don't know if that's something that um, is discussed on the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, Facebook group or often uh, when we look at coping, but I guess the whole issue is setting your own marker because mm -hmm. any of the guidelines are so fluid right now um, that even with the opening, they could 
they could change depending could on reverse. what happens. So, yeah. Uh, Doris has guess. just joined us, which is fabulous. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. But good oh, point, Regina. Hi, Doris. Hi, apologies, but my computer crashed completely, so I'm oh, on my no. Blackberry now. <laughs> okay, okay, well, we can hear you. I'm sorry that that's happened for you. Um, it seems like it's been a week of, of technical difficulties, but um, no, I think the, I'm glad. Computer, the computer is tired, that's all. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, mine too, mine too. Um, so Doris, I've, I've let people know what we're talking about today. Um, and kind of talked about some of the other content that um, uh, like about the Together We Can Do It campaign. And um, I've talked about some of our resources. So we can go straight to the COVID-19 updates from you, if that's all right. And uh, starting with sort of an overarching um, slide about vulnerable populations and then a little bit of um, more specific slides that I have um, on vulnerable populations. So we'll turn it right over to you, Doris, and we can hear you well. That's excellent, thank you. So we discuss in the, in the meetings with government and in uh, the blog that I do daily, uh, and at every opportunity, all the vulnerable populations, and, and specifically the group of seniors in nursing homes, which that one is now being aggressively addressed, but for, a, for a quite a while was not. Uh, the issue of persons experiencing homelessness, so you have seen that. And I would be interested to hear from colleagues on, on, on the webinar, uh, what's happening in your communities for persons experiencing homelessness, because while in Toronto, there is quite a bit happening, maybe in other areas, and, and people think that's insufficient, but in others, there might be even less. So I would like to hear that. What's happening with consumption and treatment services because um, very few remained open during the pandemic. Uh, not that the pandemic is gone, but very few remained open. Um, Kingston, one example, and they saw uh, probably is one of the ones that actually did not see an increase, comparatively speaking, on uh, overdose, on prevented overdose, and it's because they were open versus other cities like Toronto, where it was closed and only reopened last week, uh, the numbers doubled or more. So I would like to hear from other communities in the north or anywhere else in the province. Um, then is the population of correctional facilities, and while there have been not huge outbreaks, there have been some. Um, and of course, our uh, sisters and brothers in indigenous communities, where our team has done a tremendous, tremendous work led by Sabrina Mirali and Grace Suva and others uh, with our chief of Ontario, uh, Chief Archibald, and um, a, a whole document that is related to a fulsome plan uh, is being distributed to communities uh, later this week, as we speak. So that, that's important too. That's all in the blog and that's all on the portal. So I would recommend, I'm sure people are reviewing some of those materials because I get tons of comments every day and very important comments. And then I would like to actually hear from people, if we have a few minutes, Susan, on what other topics are people interested uh, that they want to hear. I know the issue of the reopening is a topic that is of interest. What other topics people are interested? We did speak about my, my, uh, migrant agriculture uh, workers and, uh, the, and the challenges and concerns there. So that has been discussed too. Uh, let me stop and ask and, and hear people first to go more in depth in any of them, and also to hear from your own communities, if that's okay. Just a reminder, if you can type in the chat box and we'll read those out. Um, um, we're just hearing from Wendy that in Peterborough, they opened 60 spaces of the Peterborough Wellness Center, which is typically a large facility with gyms and swimming pools and workout rooms, et cetera, with oh, staffing nice. for those who are homeless in the community. 
Um, there were washroom shower facilities and I know that food was being provided because I've seen some of that being delivered on nicer days outside in one of the open areas. That said, there is also some folks- That's from Wendy also? Live outside. That's from Wendy, yeah. Wendy, would you be able to work with them on a, you know, 500 words for a blog? I think it's very important to hear from different communities. Is that something you can take on to work with them on? Uh, they kept, they kept it, they have this space. How is it working? Who is staffing? Uh, how did they keep social distance and how is going overall? Is that doable? She says, probably this is supported by the city of Peterborough. So she'll reach up tomorrow and see what she can find out there. Fantastic. It would be fantastic if you can. Thank you. Other communities on how is it going? So Melanie has talked about independent foot care, home care services. What That's about being, it? Oh, sorry, yeah. What about it, Irma Jean? Uh, she hasn't really said, Melanie, do you want to elaborate on that? And Doris, um, what we could do is, um, I've got a couple of other slides about um, uh, vulnerable populations if um, that might spark some more questions on this topic should we mm, yeah. go to the next one yes okay uh, so this can, was, can you yeah. see this is about people living in correctional facilities yeah yeah don't worry too much because i know the topic i cannot see it but that's okay yeah i i just have on the slide that um as of April 28th, in oh, the, on, the number of uh, 80 of the 109 inmates tested positive and 21 correctional officers, and it's probably gone up beyond that now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That and the number of hours that people have been working are brutal, brutal. Yeah. Um, and then I had a slide here, Doris, about um, the comprehensive COVID-19 action plan for First Nations, Nations communities with the five so pillars this, of that? Yeah, so these are the, the five pillars that uh, we have been constantly speaking uh, and are the same pillars that we pushed in nursing homes that started um, later than what we wanted, but nonetheless, we discussed them. So we use always these same pillars. So basically, pre-outbreak testing, you, even to this day, uh, we haven't reached universal testing surveillance for nursing homes. We are moving there, but we have been asking that from the beginning. Uh, physical distancing uh, for uh, community self-isolation and for being able to cohort people. And of course, the issue of uh, a robust case and contact tracing, which has been uneven across the province in some communities better than others. Um, the universal masking and personal protection equipment overall uh, for uh, indigenous and First Nations communities as is for any other uh, vulnerable population. And in fact, for anybody at this point, including uh, the um, recommendation not fully endorsed at this stage at the federal government or provincial, but Arenio believes that people should be going with the cloth masking on the streets and it's not to protect yourself, it's to protect others because people don't realize that sometimes if they're walking on a park, now that people are going to parks inadvertently, they may be spreading uh, the virus and the issue of health human resources, especially, especially true in um, First Nations communities. And we have been working with, with the Chief Archibald and her team with a good degree of success on deploying people covered by financially by FINEP through via nurse uh, of RNO. So, uh, this plan is not that they don't have any plan. I want to make sure that people understand that First Nations have been developing plans with FINEP and with the province, but in some smaller communities, those plans are not uh, detailed enough. And this plan, which is, has been worked together, uh, our team with them, provides them detail for communities that don't have the same level of support. And we will be continuing to work to see the plans through 
in terms of advocating uh, for them to really have the right um, adequate supply of PPE, the uh, adequate supply of testing okay. kits, uh, the, the capacity to self-isolate, the use of cloth masks, which we have been already promoting and we help them also in developing, of course, by them, uh, some um, PSAs, public service announcements with youth involvement. Uh, so that's really exciting, as well as uh, human resources, as I mentioned, we have been able to deploy. So I can stop for questions or keep going. Uh, you tell me, Susan. Why don't we um, continue um, just one more slide here, I think, on um, on um, some of the vulnerable populations as we, well, we look at um, the questions here. So this, this slide is about the migra migrant agricultural workers. And I've got a quote up here, Doris, from your blog, um, that yeah. these essential workers have been leaving their families to put help put food on our tables for decades. And here we yeah. have um, so, so many of them and curious. So, so the key challenge here is both for them as you know, they live in very close proximity to one another because they rent a place that many of them are together. So just picture that. And even when they do the agriculture, it's a, it's a concern both, well, and they come and they need to self-isolate first, right? Uh, but that is being covered financially for them. So that at least is a, a better situation. Uh, but then it's also a challenge for the agriculture farmers because as you need to keep social distance that the productivity of course right um doesn't match what so it's a challenge all around i i strongly encourage that you read uh that blog um it, it's 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 a very strong piece and a nurse that works with the with the community helped in developing that blog and her name is there it's a, remember, it's an area that we have done work in the past at Arenio. It's not the first time we do um, advocacy for uh, migrant workers. Uh, there was even a resolution a few years ago uh, by a few nurses that that's their work. Uh, people often forget or think that the decisions on resolutions are being, you know, or, or on topics that we take are being taken by someone, whether it's the board or or ask the staff or us together. Many of them actually come from members, members that work on the field with different communities and really allow us to have a much more magnified and on the ground and on the pulse um, view of things. So they have been very, very excellent also in contributing to these blogs and they have been, of course, recognized with name and, and everything. Great, thank you, Doris. I, I'll um, ask a couple of questions from the chat box. This one's from Wendy. It's a, a prison question, she says. She says, um, Warkworth, a federal feds, has tested about a third of the inmates and no cases. A super jail in Lindsay is reported to have at least one positive inmate. They have reduced their typical occupancy by about 20% to provide more distancing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, in the U.S., on the other hand, major, major big numbers and the release of, um, of inmates in the U.S. has been met with a lot of issues. Uh, same uh, in some um, less well-to-do countries where families are very, very concerned um, because of the release of people that have that are back in their neighborhood that are in some instances not um, not dangerous but not light offenders too. So I don't know if you have been watching that in the news, it has been in CBC and in other news. I strongly recommend for those of you that want a view of the world that is accurate in relationship to COVID-19 to watch, to watch Al, Al Jazeera. It's fantastic. The level of in-depth and very serious reporting about what's happening in the world vis-a-vis -vis COVID is, is quite incredible. Um, 
Susan, did you what? want a couple more questions? Because I have two related to long-term care. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe if we can have the questions right now that are related to sort of the vulnerable populations group. Um, so and someone, then, yeah. Susan, someone is asking what to watch. If you can write Al Jazeera, it's a media outlet that is well, well known. Um, I can I can send that after, or I can put that in my yeah, blog. I just put no, it in. I just put no, it in. It's, it, Olivia's already got it in the chat. Yep. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. It's excellent. I strongly recommend to you. In general, I recommend it. It's even better than the uh, BBC. Very solid. Very very solid. Uh, okay, so some of the long term care questions. If a long term care resident becomes ill. Are they, um, do they not have an option to go to the hospital? That's one. And then there's a couple on assisting to work in a long-term care home. If you uh, work part-time on a doctor's office, can you help in long-term care? Um, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, the, the question is if your local community needs it. As a whole, at a renewal, we have a large, 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 I mean, we haven't closed the survey, but we have a huge number of people ready to go. Uh, we were talking before with our colleagues in long-term care with the nurse practitioners, and they were telling us because I was asking, simply because on the weekend, we had a bit of a less pressure. Previous weekends have been a lot of pressure to send people from via nurse. And it seems that things are, stabilizing a bit. In some areas, hospitals are providing good support. In other areas, we have provided um, thousands of nurses, not even hundreds. Um, and it's, I think we have served something like, I don't remember the last number, 230 nursing homes or something mm -hmm. like that. So seems think, and, and things seem to be a bit more stable. So that's number one. But you should check in your own community, and if there is a need, uh, yes, you can offer yourself. You cannot work in two nursing homes, especially if one is in an outbreak and another not. Uh, but um, and you should not work in an in an outbreak home. Period. If you are going to go back to a nursing to primary care, right? Unless your primary care is totally virtual at this time, which some are. So, Doris, just, um, can, can I can, just ask that other yeah. question I posed about sure, sure. if a resident becomes ill in a long-term care home, ah, yes. uh, do thank they you. have the option? Thank you, thank you. Um, there should be no reason why not, and let me tell you why. The hospitals are absolutely not at capacity. Um, they are at an, an, an overwhelming under capacity of utilization including vents, so there should be no reason why not. The question is, um, first of all, does that resident want to go? Uh, second, what are the chances for that person to do well? That would be my question, for example, if the person needs a ventilator, does the person really want to be in a ventilator? You know what I mean? Um, but it's not an issue of uh, feeling that there is no space in the in the hospitals. There is and there is plenty. Um, Doris, so not, it's not the common story. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Susan. Um, so that's just... a question. Just one second. So that's it. That's an important question, and it's an important conversation that teams in nursing homes need to have with the resident if the resident is, you know, able to have a, a full understanding and conversation and or with the resident and the family. It's an important conversation and one that we need to respect the resident's views, right? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Doris, what we have is six questions that have been brought up, uh, that were brought up last time that I wanted to address. And uh, so maybe we can walk through some of those as well as um, what's in the chat box. Um, but the first question you just started to answer, and I think 
the person was asking, um, you know, why are RNs allowed to work in more than one facility, like a, a hospital or a flying community and long-term care? Why are they allowed to do that? They're, they're, where people understand that they're not working in more than two long-term care homes, but why? I am so yeah. with the person that asked the question. And it's a question that I ask myself uh, and I ask in meetings because this started with the initiative of assigning, it's not asking, assigning hospitals to support the nursing homes that are in the so-called red, meaning the ones that are not doing well. Uh, you saw that with the Orchard Villa, you saw that with several, and there are, they were, I don't know how many there are today, I didn't look today, but they were last week, at the beginning of the week, 50 such facilities with five that were even assigned the army, if you remember. Um, so the idea was that, uh, first of all, these homes will receive um, support for infection control practices. As I shared with the MPs before, uh, my, my pulse on it is that some homes are very pleased about that. Those that have close relationships with hospitals always, and others are quite um, almost offended, um, at least two that call me on the weekend offended, that they know a lot about infection control. Their problem is not a problem of knowledge. Their problem is a problem of not having the necessary human resources and PPE to be able to really uh, keep, keep IPAC. And so that's more complicated, right? But that was the idea of why they could go back and forth. Then the second piece or part of it was that because hospitals have overcapacity, remember we still not, are not doing all the surgeries, the number of people that have been admitted is not as high as it was thought that it would be. Then they are, they are asking, uh, originally they were going to assign, but I believe most hospitals are asking for volunteers to go to support nursing homes that have a shortage. Uh, in some cases, it's working very well, and we have heard about that, and those are usually people that are in the hospital that either work extra hours in a nursing home always, or people that used to work in a nursing home and are now in the hospital. Uh, in some other places, it does not work so well, um, and people go, well, in, an, in some other places, people didn't volunteer, period, right? So very few volunteers, so the home is still short, and that's when they are accessing via nurse, and we're sending people. And in some others, still, uh, they go, and then when they find how is the situation and how serious it is, then they don't go back, and again, that's why we launched that fourth survey with BNRs. That is the survey that is for people that are willing and ready and understanding that they will be deployed to a nursing home in an inactive outbreak. And I can tell you that I got a call um, on fr this Friday or last, I don't remember anymore. It all looks the same to me. I don't want to mention the home. I believe it was this Friday um, or Thursday. It was Thursday. And the home needed uh, support. In fact, the executive director stayed to do a night shift because that's how desperate they were. The director of nursing, all of them stayed. And in a matter of hours, they already had CVs. And the next day, they had people during the day, evening, and night shift. So that's thanks to our team that really will respond at any time when there are requests for human resources. So it's, it's you know, it's not a, it's a complicated answer to that question because in some instances, the different modalities of support are working in different ways depending on the community. I think in small communities, all in all, they have much more tighter relationships with their hospitals in general and it's working quite well. In some others, it's, it's is less satisfactory because they see them as, you know, just coming to give directions. So at least that's how some are perceiving versus coming and staying to provide support. 
I don't know if that helps the answer, but I don't know if the person that asked the question is there. Yeah, I'm not sure if that person who asked the question is on the line right now, but um, thank you for your answer. Um, uh, the next one is also about long-term care, and then there's one in the chat box that I'll follow up with. So the next one is about taking care of families. And the question is, will the government help families take care of family members that they take out of long-term care homes during COVID-19 by providing community services, palliative doctor connections, or GP connections? Is long-term care homes are discharging residents instead of doing a 21-day first visit, a visit first and leaving families with no community resources? Are we talking about so we move from residents, right? Is this about people that were in the hospital and discharged? Uh, try to try again. Um, will the government help families take care of family members that they, so they take them out of long-term care homes? Oh, so from long-term care. Yeah. So because of COVID. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, that uh, that was in, the in a discussion for quite some time about thinking twice before someone takes people home because it's very easy to say, yes, we will take the person because we are afraid. And if that person requires intense support, that's in the first place why I was put in the nursing home. Uh, I am not sure the, the system is set up uh, to provide, you know, 24 by seven, for example, right? Um, so, yeah, the issue with home care, uh, you will see next week when you see our report, um, the issue, we really built an over-reliance in our view on hospital care and an underwhelming um, utilization of all other sectors. Primary care for once became for the most virtual. Uh, now we are starting to see some issues with people that need primary care that waited too long, uh, home care that we didn't provide enough PPE and patients were canceling some visits, rightfully so, because I mean, I wouldn't let if I have cancer or something or a wound or whatever, let someone from outside coming without a mask, even if it's a nurse. So that was a challenge and, and home care agencies were struggling to find PPE because just picture, St. Elizabeth, whatever they use in the year, now they were using three times that in a month, right? Because of the need to change. So, so PPE was and is still not readily available. So not all visits get uh, respected, right? Or, or some get canceled. And hence why I forgot to mention in nursing homes, also home care now is going to help. I know St. Elizabeth is in some, Bayshore is in another, in a couple of others, right? To provide support in nursing homes um, in terms of staffing. When, so so um, I don't know, it's a very interesting, a very important question. I don't know the percentage or the number of, it will be an important question, Heather, to us, Advantage Health and, uh, and, LTC, and um, uh, OLTC, what's the number of residents that actually families have taken home? And have we done any evaluation to see how did they fare? Because I think it's a hugely important question because I don't think that they would have gotten, you know, certainly not 24 by seven, uh, but I don't know how many visits they would have gotten, period, right? And some of those residents are pretty complex. Mm -hmm. not, that I am, not that we are advocating against taking people home. I'm just saying it's, it was not a simple initiative to take. And if people were kind of, you know, thinking, oh, I will get the support at home from home care, they might not necessarily have received what they thought they might. Right, thank you for that. Yeah, it seems like it's um, not, all the resources are not necessarily there in place and ready to go. I just wanna say that there are a couple of decision support tools that have been developed both for um, retirement homes and long-term care homes when you're thinking about 
having a loved one come home and live with you. So we can make those available on our- That's on our fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Doris, maybe I'll ask one question from the chat box um, to do with long-term care before we move on to a question about naloxone. Um, actually, the fourth question in this one are maybe similar. Um, so long-term care, some long-term care homes who have residents, they go for dialysis three times a week um, and are asking hospitals to have these residents. Um, I'm not quite sure what Sarah is saying in this part of her question actually, but I think it's a real challenge to self-isolate and the back and forth and the transportation back and forth from hospital to- Oops, what's happened? Oh my. So maybe the no, we can hear you Doris. Oh, I and don't know what's happened with the computer. It kind of did. Whoop. Okay, well, we can see you and hear you, so we're good. But we're just realizing it's 7.30. Do we want to do our chair now, or do we want to wait until at the end of the session? You guys decide. We're at as a long as, now. Maybe we as long going. as people will stay, because now we have a good number. Yeah. I yeah. think um, because it takes a, a little while for um, Olivia to promote people, maybe we can do it at the very end and record I think that's it a good then, idea. Yeah. And then if people want to indicate in the chat box, if you want to get your cameras on um, for the cheer, just type in the chat box that you, you want your camera on and then Olivia can make that happen. And so Doris, just going back to that question, did you hear what it was? It's sort of the back and forth of the person from long-term care going to the hospital for dialysis. Did you hear that question? No, I didn't, sorry. Hello? Sorry, and there's, there's a lot of background noise here for the chair. Listen to the chair in the background. <laughs> no. um, so um, maybe someone else can, um help yeah, I'll, I'll ask i'll ask where would you ask the question that's fine no. Susan. so this is someone asking a question about someone from long-term care who's required to go three times a week uh, to the hospital for dialysis and what a challenge this is because every time they come out of the hospital back to the long-term care home they have to self-isolate and it just seems uh, a challenge to the resident, a waste of resources. And I think you're saying, should they not just stay in the hospital or is there some other way? Good question. Good question. Yeah. And I suppose uh, if we had PPE, they could do it in home care. Um, yeah, good question. There was also an issue with dialysis machines, by the way. Um, they were afraid that there will be shortages of dialysis machines at one point. Yeah. Uh, I will ask that question tomorrow. And Doris, this is maybe a slightly related question, but maybe not absolutely, but just wondering about appropriate transformation, transportation, excuse me, for COVID-19 patients who are discharged from the hospital, like what is the appropriate way to transfer individuals once they've left the hospital mm -hmm. um, to be able to go home? I'm assuming to go to go home and just not really being clear on what the protocols for that should be. So that is the same as transportation from the airport when people needed to go to self-isolation, remember? And yep. that would mean that would mean um, in 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 the usual transportation that people go, just not in groups, right? One person with the PPE, right? Um, mm -hmm. And straight there, not stopping somewhere else or whatever. But the usual. I haven't heard anything different. Okay. Oh, I see some comments. Someone else may have heard different. Um, just lots of comments here. There's so many. Yeah. Um, I think so. some of them can, are um, can one of you oh, ask the discharge planning and follow up question? Sorry, if my background noise is kind of loud. So okay. Ramiji, maybe you could read that last question if you can see it, and I will scan through the chat box because there's lots of comments. Okay, so there's one here as a, oh, it just 
says it um, may need to be done by a case by case basis to hospital. I can't address. hear you, Imagine. Um, it may need to be done on a case by case basis uh, to hospitalize residents from long term care in hospital, but beds are available and hospital staff are available, as just as you said. Now, that's in terms of transport of moving the, the resident to the hospital, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yes, well, I'm, and but the first thing I think, I mean, that's different than the dialysis issue, right? You wouldn't mm -hmm. leave a person yeah, without dialysis, it is. yeah. But the yeah. other issue if a person, if a pay, if a resident starts to not do well. First of all, just out of many that I have heard their situation, um, don't right away despair. That's number one. I have seen quite a few residents of nursing homes that actually become better after a few days when everybody thought, you know, it's done. Uh, so that's number one. But if really deteriorates, it depends deteriorating to what? and what that person wanted before COVID. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Usually residents in nursing homes, uh, even upon admission, I know, they have discussed what is it that is their wish, and not every resident will want to be transferred to a hospital. So that conversation is critical pre-COVID, during COVID, and after COVID, because we need to respect what the residents want and what they and their family, if the resident cannot, is their wish rather than what we think. Um, so, and it is on a case by case basis, as it yeah. was before, right? Yeah. Morgan's just saying in London, there are conversations that take place between long term care and the hospital about whether the resident stays in the hospital for the duration of the pandemic if they require, you know, a, a lot of acute uh, care interventions. And again, the clarity of goals so, of care, life, and the resident's wishes. Yeah, no, so the directive on that is pretty clear and remains the same, Morgan. It has not changed. That residents, that once they go to the hospital, they cannot be transferred back for the 14-day isolation to your facility. So that was a directive that happened uh, twice last week because there was a lot of confusion and people were sent back to the nursing home. And, ah, you're talking about dialysis. That's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so oh, can I just say that interesting a patient from Scarborough Hospital walked home from the hospital on discharge. I don't know if this was somebody that was there for COVID reasons, followed by a relative in their vehicle. The patient was quoted twelve hundred dollars for private hospital transport. Yeah, there's a few questions here about. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to skip that comment though. Yeah. Um, that's that's. Yeah, I would, I would not, yeah. There's a question about that. I would have taken the patient with me, I need to tell you, if I was the family member. Just Pretty corner the back seat. Huh? <laughs> yes. Pretty corner with, the back seat. With PPE? I would have. I would not have allowed the patient to walk by themselves. But, oh. <laughs> but there are a number of comments being made how people are being charged exorbitant rates for transportation, uh, probably just because they can, right? Um, yeah. But and wanting RNAO to advocate for... We, we definitely can. We yeah. definitely can advocate. And on that note, please write in your chat a few things. What other things you think we should advocate for? We will, of course, look at them, and some of them we may have answers already. And second, what other topics you would like to see in the blog that we either will, like now I said to, to Wendy, if she can work with the Peterborough people, we may approach other people, or you may want to offer that you want to write something uh, by all means, uh, and also what else you would like us to discuss, and I will endeavor to, to do research and write on that, or to ask mm -hmm. those that I need to ask. Great, thank you, Doris. So we'll compile that if people can write that in the chat box and there have already been some ideas. So thank you for Thanks. those. And, and you can ask even after, um, Susan, yeah. because we have covered the main, main big topics. And mm -hmm. now things are, you know, I think, I think a lot will be about the reopening and what's safe, what's yeah. safe. But, but I think people may have important areas that we have not covered. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, so I'm wondering, I've got four sort of existing questions. Can we try to get through those? We've got 20, mm -hmm. 20 minutes left minus five for cheering. <laughs> um, so, so let's try to get through a few of these questions that we have on the slides and what's in the chat box in the next 20 minutes. So um, just one last question, um, Doris, I think you just answered, but wondered if there's anything more you, you want to say about once a person is cleared of COVID, how long is full PPE and contact precautions? I think you just said 14 days when a resident can be reintroduced or when can the person go to the non-COVID side? So is that the 14 days or is there anything more you want to say just to clarify? 14 days, 14 days plus, 14 days plus two back-to-back -back negative tests within 24 hours. Okay, great, thanks for clarifying. So we'll switch gears to a naloxone question. And the question is, when working in the community with clients who use substances, what precautions should be taking taken when administering naloxone in the event of a suspected opioid poisoning? What sort of PPE should be used and how should you proceed if rescue breaths are needed? Well, that's pretty clear to me then, full gear, if you, if you need. And this is the issue that has happened um, with a well, they closed some of the sites, which I don't know if that was the solution, right? Uh, but you also, same as in a nursing home, and those discussions have happened on nursing home and related to palliative care, uh, you will not, you know, if, if, if you need to do CPR, you're not going to do your usual CPR because there's no way you can do that, right? Um, so other interventions need to use, but this may be an area that is important for a block, actually. It's a, it's a hugely important area yeah, of what they're doing. Right now, in the consumption treatment services, they are using full gear, and they're pushing and fighting for gear, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, what do you do in a cardiac arrest? What do you do in a, mm -hmm. not, just with, not just with overdose, right? Uh, my hunch is that they will tell you you cannot engage with uh, anything that is uh, mouth to mouth, right? Uh, but l let's check on that. That will be, yeah. And we heard even from our colleagues in palliative care in the nursing homes that they're not engaging um, on any procedures that can aerolize the, the virus, i.e., suctioning. So, so for sure, others that are more even um, risky, you, you wouldn't. But it, it's interesting. It never came the question in any of our meetings, uh, or probably people assume like, the same as I am assuming. Uh, but let me do homework, and and that will be an important, an important, um, not only question from a factual and evidence evidence-based perspective, but actually for the moral distress of the colleagues that are working there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Wendy and Sarah are both responding in the chat box, um, saying that it's a hands-only. Um, so Sarah says it's been addressed with hands-only and use of devices to keep airflow. This and, is with, uh, yeah, like air, uh, uh, or, or, or yeah. something. And Wendy's yeah. saying some of the teaching relate relate to arrests, whatever the cause in the community where PPE is not at hand is to do chest compressions with no breathing. Here you go, same as I mm -hmm. mentioned, because that's the logical thing, paramedics too, right? Yeah, and Kathleen adds that yes, all codes are protected, meaning full PP, PPE, as you do um, not know the risk of possible intubation. So that's interesting as well. Yeah. And more than saying the hospital plans for cardiac arrest are very interesting right now. The direction is to wait for an N95 mask fit tested person with full PPE. Yeah. yeah interesting. Thank you, everyone, for those responses. Yeah. Um, but likely more reflective of acute care than the. Yeah. Yeah. Care. Yeah. Yeah. I think Morgan put something. Is it about egg valve masks? Yeah. Yeah. ADMP, so it doesn't get done until the mask fit tested team is there. Yeah. Thanks, Morgan. 
Okay, so we'll think about that, um, Doris, to see if there's anything outstanding that we wanted to talk about further. And yeah, um, I, I, the issue of moral distress for the health mm. professional um, is serious, right? The same is in long-term care with people that are being palliated, except that there you have drugs to at least support, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, now Sharon has said CPR done under protective sheet. Okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of protocols being yeah. done. Mm -hmm. Can people send us some of those protocols? They're in the chat. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, so anyone who's on the line now who has existing protocols, you can send them um, to Olivia, who you probably have her email address. Um, Olivia, maybe you can confirm that, but I think they would all have your email address probably. She can um, post it. Yeah, or put it right in the chat box. That's the best yeah. idea. Thank you. So maybe I'll move on to um, the last two questions and Doris that are here on the screen. Um, what, they both came in today. So mandatory deployment. Um, a group of staff were told that they were being sent to the ICU from ER um, and that they don't have any choice and they cannot grieve it because the union has no power to tell them that they, they aren't, you know, that they can't be sent. Um, do you have any comments so, about So first of all, that comment is factual. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the directives that enabled um, under the emergency status uh, was, if, if I'm not wrong, was either the first or second directive uh, or under the emergency status that enabled the employer to move people from one organization to another or from one unit to another. And yes, they have no right to refuse. So the question is, I think, is it done in a safe way at least, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, is the, is the practice of the person um, up to speed to what, the new to what the new area needs to be, right? So I think you mentioned emergency room and ICU. Yeah, for the most, mm -hmm. yes. Right. If you were to do OR and ICU, the answer is really not. Right? And I think, I mean, I want to believe that our colleagues um, that are involved, chief nurses, et cetera, in organizations are being uh, quite responsible because I think they have the same interests as everybody else of patient safety. And, and we all know that, um, that people may not always like it, right? Uh, people are not always wanting to also go to nursing homes. In nursing homes themselves, some organizations, and I do need to give kudos to RNs and RPNs because for the most they have stayed at work, uh, but in some organizations they have lost almost all their PSWs. I mean, in the weekend when I needed to support one of our colleagues in a nursing home, the moment that uh, her team uh, heard that they needed to move to the uh, residents with COVID or COVID, you know, segregated residents, um, several of the, of the PSWs said, sorry, I'm, I'm not going, and they quit on the spot. And, you know, we can't have the cake, we can't you know, have the cake, what is it, and, and eat it all, or whatever is the story. Because we have, as a system, I'm saying, treated personal support workers as dispensable individuals, with all the respect, and I think that we need to really think hard about that. Um, about 50% uh, of them work for multiple employers, meaning they have not been able to attend attain full employment. So then why would, you know, they hear, oh, you're moving me there. Well, I'm going with the other home. Uh, and then there are very valid reasons on some situations that the person either has a very immunocompromised person at home or whether it's a child or a spouse or a sister or doesn't matter who. 
and you know, and we saw that during SARS-2. Uh, all in all, I think we haven't seen the exit or the exodus of RNs and RPNs, and that speaks both that the higher education you have, the more responsibility you feel. It's also the question of being regulated versus not. And next, what we will hear, well, then let's make sure PSWs are regulated. Well, we have that discussion before. The answer was no, because they don't have a unique body of knowledge, right? Uh, so the answer is give them full-time employment, give them full employment. So we've, the whole thing in nursing homes need to shape big time, right? Big time. More RNs, more RPNs, and then P for every nursing home. Uh, CNSs are not enough in nursing homes. Uh, PSWs give them more full time. And it's not only an issue of the skill mix, that for sure is also the issue of the numbers, right? They're run off their feet in good days. So let alone in, in COVID time. Um, Doris, I'm just noticing there are some, a number of comments from people saying, oh, a nurse was deployed to another department. They were told they'd get support. They weren't. Um, and uh, some concern about this. And I'm wondering if that isn't uh, maybe a blog topic about why that is happening under the emergency um, uh, measures. And number two, um, it is important. But number three, um, the you know, pleading or whatever with people to really respect that and um, provide the kind of support. Uh, because I, it does sound like people are getting quite frustrated about it and uh, not truly understanding that there is a purpose behind it. However, they have to be treated um, in a way that enables them to give safe care. Yeah, so the orientations are pretty short. And Morgan can talk about that, and it's in all the organizations. Uh, and they are short because, you know, mm -hmm. everything started late. Uh, if you look at the blogs on when Arena started to say that we needed to start to redeploy and, tra and train, it happened a lot later overall. And that was not an issue of the hospitals or of any specific sector. That was an issue of, of um, our uh, directives from... Uh, either Public Health Ontario or our, uh, our Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, and then, for the most, and I receive still many, many, many emails every single day, just so you know, from nurses, whether it's weekend, night, or day, and they get surprised that I answer sometimes because I'm still at the computer and it's late. Uh, for the most, the relationship between frontline nurses, and I'm talking all the categories, and management, whether middle or senior management, I think has gone very well. In some instances, and I would say few from what I read, has been pathetic. And actually, I have exposed that without saying the organization or the person. But I did want to send a message, so I did cut and paste the email without saying from where even though the person say, I hope you will put the name and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, it reminds me on when, when we had our own replacement, not that we don't have now, hopefully we will not have more, but years ago in the nineties, and some managers were saying at that time, even chief nurses to nurses, well, if you don't like it, tough luck, I have someone mm -hmm. waiting on the line. Uh, some of those answers we have heard now also, about, well, this is the way it is, and if you don't like it, just go and someone else will come because there is such a surge, right, in terms of capacity in the hospitals. But honestly, there have been, I cannot count it even in one hand. For the most, the relationships have work that I am really impressed and inspired this time. So yeah, I can write about that. If you can capture the issue, I will write, but I want to write in a balanced way because it really has worked quite well for the most. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think yeah. that tone will inspire others too, who might yeah. not be. <laughs> be yeah. You know what has worked less well and that we don't talk enough? 
the fact that still people are going home. And I'm not saying these are nurses because actually no one can know if they're nurses. The people that write to me say they're nurses, but my question has been always to them, how do you know they're nurses? They may not be nurses and have you told them, right? They live with the scrap and with the shoes and with everything. And then they go to buy the bread or the supermarket or whatever. And that is so dangerous, huh? it's so dangerous. And I don't think people think too much with the head when they do that. So once in a while I put the issue again, I could be writing every day about that, but people will get annoyed. But really it's at least once, at least three times a week I receive emails like that or four. And some you have seen in the blog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, so boys, I'm going to interject now because it's 7.55 and um, there we have one, you know, we have other questions, but I think we wanted to cheer and um, kind of end, close this call with a cheer and people are um, getting their noisemakers and people are being promoted to panelists. So I can ask... Um, oops. Okay, this doesn't look too good with a knife like this. All big businesses and every single healthcare worker. Essential workers <laughs> and for in there. Next week, <laughs> ready for a big party. <sighs> yes, um, so, so Doris, I did mention. I did mention that next week we're having a special Nursing Week webinar, COVID, but Nursing Week uh, flavor. Um, and the, stay tuned for that for more details. Stay on tuned that. for that and more. We yes, will and more. Be to work virtual. We are going to have a release of a report on the 12th. We are going to have awards on the 12th. We are going to have a whole week of a party. <laughs> Great. So um, I think what we'll do, Doris, is um, our team will look at the, any outstanding questions, bring forth answers to next week or anything to you as far as emerging issues that need to be addressed before then. Um, so I'll leave. I'll leave you to close the webinar and hopefully see many of you um, next week as well. Fantastic! Thank you so to the many, many that came. Send us questions, and if any of you wants to contribute pieces to the blog on important aspects of your work, absolutely, please do. And if you guys want to be involved in media interviews, especially if you're in the front lines of care. It will be hugely important regardless of the sector. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Susan, everybody. for organizing. Bye. And Heather and Thanks, Irmatina everybody. and everyone. Olivia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.